He was brave. He was sensational. Wow. Everything would change from cowboys and Indians in about five seconds. He was so cool and calm under fire. He was so in himself. He was bitter. He was vengeful. Burn your face to hide your identity. He was dull. Your evil can never win. He was humorless. Ruben, I'll kill you. But he could fight like buggery. There was always a certain element of magic involved in what they were doing. Very much saturated in the culture of the Western. And we'd never seen an Eastern. Nineteen sixty four Australia, a country on the brink. In less than nineteen years since the end of World War Two, they've built the good life. Those dark days with the Japanese at the door are now a distant memory. But this cosy world is about to change forever. Three days after Christmas, commercial TV station Channel 9 screened the first episode of a show that would rock the country. For the kids of Australia, the TV series The Samurai became an obsession. I just sat down one night after school and thought, geez, what's this? This looks all right. This looks good. Please help me. You stupid fool. What made you think you could escape from me? The first time I experienced it, it was like an awakening of something. Oh, I'm sorry. Please excuse the boy. Did I really see these weird Japanese guys wrapped in bandages running through an, an ancient town? Let's go. Yes. I turned to Mum and said, what the fuck is this? Look at this. These are people killing each other and the words don't match their mouths. It's like I've gone to heaven. What's wrong? There was a terrible face in the mirror. A guy with long flowing hair, how cool is that? Ah. Aussie kids fell into a new fantasy world. You! I am not Saranobu. My name is Shintaro. Why you? You tricked me. Where's Saranobu? You Koga ninja. You're all fools. This man must die. <laughs> to the astonishment of their parents, they became Japanese. <laughs> they were samurai and something called ninjas, shouting his name across the backyards of Australia. <laughs> Somebody must have thought this is slightly unusual, us showing a dubbed Japanese adventure program set, you know, three to four hundred years ago. But who those people were, well, I've never heard of them ever since. Everybody else takes credit for the year. It'd be a brilliant idea and it must go to air. The Samurai was loosely based on historical events, taking place during the late 1700s. The story goes like this. Akikusa Shintaro, our hero, was hired by the Premier to protect the young Shogun from the evil warlords. His adventures lead him to befriend an eager ninja by the name of Tombei the Mist and an orphan boy named Shusaku. Together, they embarked on protecting the government from the endless supply of evil assassins known as the ninjas. Take off your mask! <laughs> Shintaro Akiksa. I don't know about the others, but you cannot fool this master ninja's eyes. Wait! So much for the details. But that's not why the samurai and Shintaro swept the country and made some older Australians ask, who really won the war anyway? You got to see something which was just totally unusual, which was totally, totally, totally out of the norm that you would see on television. And the scenes of Japan, of the mountains, of the villages and all that sort of thing. I mean, this was another world. This wasn't, you know, Kuji. <laughs> Get to your work at once. Right. So, 
What were they looking at in this new world that had turned everything on its head? The special effects. <laughs> we died together! She's like, oh, look out! I told you, there were no effects in the samurai. They were all absolutely real. Not that I would have thought it was a special effect, like the thing of the jumping out of trees. For some reason, it never bothered anyone that most of the stunts shown in the series were physically impossible, like walking on water. We'll meet again. <laughs> the stuff that they could do with ropes and hooks, it was just a whole extraordinary, marvellous, surprising world. Seeing Japanese uh, as children, we had no idea what Japanese were. My grandmother had a broomstick which she used to attach broom heads to, and I used to stick the broomstick in the back, and I just loved pulling out a sword from behind. So I was, also loved Zorro. This was a bit pansy. This was... Which as kids we just thought was absolutely fabulous and the sensational 30-foot jump upward or back out of the trees. It was just a marvellous thing and so suddenly that took over our world of fantasy. In the samurai we saw something very special. We saw something completely different yet kind of the same. We had the good guy killing the bad guy but in a way that seemed more accessible yet further away. Then there was the stuff that was just weird. Ah! The lampshade at home, we had a lampshade that used to sit in the corner of the lounge room. I kept on thinking, if I put it on my head and get my mum to, to punch needles through the fr uh, front, I could have that hat, the big sort of the basket hat, that oriental Ned Kelly style thing. I love the, the laundry basket on his head was certainly stuck in my mind. Hombre, follow me. What? And then there was the acting. Oh, there was this acting style which was so unusual. Genkuro tried to kill Sadanobu with a rocket. What? what? A big rhetorical what? acting style that you might have seen in Victorian melodramas or something. It was all very sort of sharp and and uh, oh, and big reactions and that, which we thought was, on the one hand, hysterical but uh, exciting. Genretsu, taikongoren gyo, nichirenzai, naibakujin. It was something that parents would not be interested in, so it was something you had to yourself. And something you shared with uh, the cognoscenti, those who might have watched it with you. In the, the same people who might have read uh, Phantom comics and who were interested in old jungle sayings. You know, some nights the Phantom walks the streets dressed as an ordinary man. This is one of those nights. Well, for some of us that was sort of interesting. <laughs> We saw a form of athletism that we'd never seen before, the whole idea of the martial arts movements. Ha, hoo, ha. Making similar noises. Boys love to make uh, strange noises that sound like they're burping and make weird movements with their arms. It was heaven on a stick. It will be interesting to see what they do. But apart from the whole new world of samurai and ninjas, the thing that has stuck to this day in the memories of the children of that generation was the shurikens, commonly known as those bloody star knives. For some reason, it was just really satisfying going... I mean, it was just sort of nuts. You'd only have one star knife, but then you'd keep throwing them afterwards. Sticking in the wood, and they never hit him. He was always deflecting them and stuff, and how he could see them coming at him was always amazing. <laughs> I remember eating my wagon wheels in the shape of a star so that I could hold it in my hand. I didn't do metal work at the time, but I did go home and use my mother's dressmaking scissors to cut out tin can lids to make, to make the throwing stars. And not that they worked very well. Uh, it was a curious thing about the samurai that Shintaro, or Shintaro Akikusa, only had to stand beside a tree and suddenly it was alive with bloody star knives. They had no trouble at all hitting trees. They just couldn't hit people. I once tied my sister to the back fence as practice, as a target, for me to 
piff star knives made out of paint tin lids at her, then all of Dad's paint went off because they had no lids anymore. So it was a belting all round for me, but that was the only thing. It didn't stop them, though. They thought it was good character building, mostly for my sister. Ninjas are stupid. <laughs> That's right. We well, got like, we the got samurai them. spirit as 11-year-old as children. Suddenly, he was Shintaro and a Japanese hero that we gladly, thrillingly embraced. But no awareness that this was a major cultural shift somehow, but it must have been, it was, because it, he was the first. No one had expected it, but Japanese TV was invading Australia. And it would bring more than star knives and fancy swordplay. Stop and they're going to kill each other. At the Silver Ace? Yeah, they're wrecking the place. No kidding. In the world before Shintaro and the Samurai, kids' TV was OK, but it was pretty predictable. And while the kids were happy to watch, they were also up for something new. What's the idea? I'm breaking this up before somebody really gets hurt. No gal's telling me what to do. This gal is. The sort of things we had in children's television with Mickey Mouse Club and we had a lot of cowboys and Indians, that sort of thing. I actually preferred the White Indians. I thought they were much more interesting than the cowboys. White man, steal from Navajo. Many, many times. Oh, do you know what? I've discovered that one of the Cabbage Quiz contestants has never drunk Ovaltine before. Not all the kids' shows Boy, came from overseas, but even the local shows were in a rut. <laughs> <laughs> Although I have been there for a long time, I wasn't actually working for Channel 9 in the early 60s. I started in the late 60s. However, as I say, we did have a relationship. We used to be allowed to go up there to go to Desmond Tester and the Channel 9 pins being recorded in the studios at our Tarman Road, yeah, Willoughby. Thank you, Stanley Stafford, my boy. Oh, by the way, girls and boys. But it was that period of time where Australia was coming out of the 1950s where everything was very almost anal. Everything was ordered, everybody knew what they were supposed to do, even down to the family pets I think knew what they were supposed to do. But the times, they were a-changing. Whether the old folks liked it or not, something was in the air. The Beatles had happened the year before in Australia, and so uh, people that were born sort of late 40s, early 50s, were starting to find a little bit of voice, and uh, there was huge change. Everything was starting to be questioned. And it was just before it really started changing and going into the 60s, the late 60s, 70s, where you suddenly had all that culture brought out of, uh, you know, the Vietnam War that came into Australia, the revolution in film and television and just uh, culture that happened after that. But it was that little grey area in between real 1950s Australia and what it became afterwards. Put them on board. You know you don't. I'll kill you now, Shintaro. The samurai was always going to look exotic compared to the comfortable world of Aussie suburbia. Did you see that, Kensai? What? But it wasn't oh, just the swordplay and the ninja stars that made everyone sit up and take notice. The bath scene. He sent his ninja against us. The famous bath scene where we see Shintaro naked in the big Japanese bath. Back then, especially as children, you didn't see nakedness on television. It was a bit of a surprise to suddenly have a scene with Shintaro in this bath. Contacting various landowners when things got really tough, Shintaro bathed. That guy bathed through the 17th century. I tell you, whenever there was any pressure on Shintaro, I'd go and have a bath and think about it. As far as I can tell, was Shusaku, who was after a 10-year-old kid, standing up naked, but naked, uh, fortunately the back view, and you just didn't see nudity in those days. And we were like, did you see the bath scene? Yes! <laughs> that was the big thing. Like, <laughs> well, 
Well, some of us sort of said, well, it was Pete wasn't one of the adults, really. <clears throat> then I'll give you anything you want, if you can catch me. The kids were sort of shocked, but at the same time, you know, really excited that a sort of adult idea of a grown man having a bath was shown on kids' TV. And, you know, we just felt the boundaries just being pushed a little bit by this program, whereas in Japan, I'm sure it didn't even raise an eyebrow, but for us, it was quite novel. Shintaro, Tomei isn't drowned, is he? The samurai also pushed the boundaries on issues like violence. But then, as the kids saw it, Japanese violence was different. It was kind of confronting because it wasn't a comedy. So when you're watching Tom and Jerry or any kind of cartoon where, where there's violence, or the Three Stooges, or even Jerry Lewis, even uh, Laurel and Hardy, there's a lot of violence in Laurel and Hardy, but it's all comedy. We recognised that it was cartoon violence, and my parents recognised that it was cartoon violence. We knew you couldn't kill people like that. We knew people didn't die that way. Gentaro, I really hate to kill a man with your intelligence. The samurais, the lone gunman or swordsman, wandering the countryside, fighting off bad guys, saving the girl or saving the good people. You know, that Clint Eastwood analogy is very close. Shintaro could be surrounded by upwards of 20 or 30 Koga ninjas. They would only ever attack from the front, one at a time. I used to say, well, just buddy, get in there. If they all went in, you know, all you needed to say was, now, go. I mean, he could have been mincemeat within seconds, but no, 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 no. They had to approach him one at a time. There were so many bodies and all this yelling and screaming going on, it was pretty graphic. And my grandfather used to say, you'd have to clean out the back of the TV set before we can watch the next episode. <laughs> I've lost this fight, Shintaro. The amazing thing about the samurai obsession was the villains were as popular as the Shining Knight, Shintaro. And it was the only show I've ever seen where the kids wanted to be the ninjas, not Shintaro. They wanted to jump around, wear black pyjamas and, and, and get killed. The Puma Ninja Spider attack. Get him! The Spider Ninja were probably the guys that really made me sit up and go, wow, that's pretty weird. <laughs> They hung up in trees on rope spider webs, waiting to drop down on uh, unsuspecting samurai. <laughs> I remember the puppet ninjas. That was very interesting. They were disguised as a band of travelling puppeteers. And uh, Shintaro couldn't see through that, the idiot. The other thing about those ninjas was, what you saw wasn't necessarily what you got. One of the great disguises that the ninjas would use would be as an old man carrying sticks. So you'd have this hunched old bloke with this rack full of sticks on his back, and uh, Shintaro would go, oh, now, where are you going now? Who are you? And he would just say, I'm just an old man carrying sticks. And as soon as he got sticks out, he'd try and cut Shintaro's head off. He was a bad bastard. What is it, old man? Eh, I was stupid. I dropped my flint and stone somewhere. And I very much would like to smoke my pipe right now, uh, if I could. <laughs> I didn't know who the bad guys were. You could have told me that, the, that, that Shintaro was the bad guy and I would have believed it. I, I didn't quite know what was going on. Shintaro, do you think that old man is an Agishi ninja? No, even a very well-trained ninja would show evil intentions on his face. No, I don't think that he was a ninja in disguise. But if that old man was a ninja... If he was? Then he would be one of their most skillful ones. Originally made only for Japanese television, the samurai was naturally filmed in Japanese. But the producers were thinking big. They dreamed of reaching out to the lucrative English-speaking market. Japanese animation like Astro Boy had recently made a killing in the US, and maybe the samurai could do the same thing, which meant the series had to be dubbed into English. Here is the real murder weapon that I hold in my hand. 
And there's ten pieces of gold. Not only was it dubbed, it was badly dubbed. They made no attempt to try to actually match up what they were saying with the way people's mouths moved. And they would still continue talking after the people themselves had their mouths closed. So it was like watching a ventriloquist act along with everything else. So that intrigued us. The why those? You know, still there's mates of mine who are a ring and go, why those? And they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Why you? Ho, 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 ho. Like that, because there's a lot of that sort of laughter. And uh, oh, oh, I know what you're thinking, and I've got you. Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> Come now, we go at once now. The road to Edo is for me, Ninja now. I just escaped from the Koga Ninja. I'm a carpenter. My name is Sozo. Oh, please don't punish me. Don't kill me. Everything ended with a now, or... and then it would speed up at the end of a sentence. We, uh, for, we didn't you know? Always like that. Old man. I did all this. You what? As it went on in years, the dub became more kitsch and became more of... it made the show more humorous. Yeah, it gave it another well, humorous element that people would watch it for. No. Drink a little of this. If you've ever watched any that are subtitled and not dubbed, oh, they're rubbish. <laughs> I, I find it very difficult to watch them and enjoy them. I find the dubbing really it seems to add to it for some bizarre reason, which I don't really understand. I, I love it. I can't get enough of the dubbing. Oh! Old man, what are you doing? Jintaro Wakikusa, I am here to kill you. I'm embarrassed to say that I don't know that I noticed as a kid. That voice. Why, you're the Nagishi ninja who attacked the boat. I wasn't trying to read his lips. <laughs> you are right. I am the death ninja who has come for you. I have come here to bring you death. Until I succeed, I will never leave you alone. There was one scene with the now death ninja, where he was, he was impervious to being cut. And Shintaro was slicing and dicing and he was going, <laughs> and Shintaro couldn't kill him with the blade of the sword. And Tombe was drugged at the time. He'd been given some poison and he could barely speak, but Tombe's lying on the ground and he's going, Shintaro, Shintaro. Shintaro, don't cut him. Use the blunt side of your sword. And, and Shintaro goes, oh, and uses the blunt end of the sword to beat him to death. That was my first introduction to lateral thinking. That was a turning point. Shintaro was unbeatable. The Japanese had become an essential part of Aussie childhood, something that would cause a national controversy. Shintaro, I lost this fight. Be careful. Yes. The effects of the samurai show you know spread dogs, quickly across Australia. Give me those things. Schoolyards became oriental battlegrounds as the young samurais and ninjas laid into each other with a lethal array of homemade weaponry. These things will take your eye out, okay? The school system take didn't know off. what had hit it. Go on, get to class. Off to class. Sydney headmaster Rex Morgan was the first to take a stand. Because of the way they were all behaving with it in the playground and, and you know, running around hurting each other, um, in the excitement of the, of the cult, uh, I banned it and I said, well, we're not going to have any of this. They suddenly made out as if we'd all gone Shintaro mad and turned into little ninjas, ignoring the fact that we'd been playing cowboys and itchy bums for the last 30 years and slaughtering one another left, right and centre with, a, you know, the garden rake. That, however, didn't impact on people because that was OK, that was cowboys and Indians. Do you understand me? Yes. Even bowing on the playground was going on um, at Coogee Prep. Oh, forgive me, sir. Uh, 
it's all right. At the time that the samurai came out, you have to remember that uh, the war had only been over less than 20 years. So, of course, there were plenty of adults and the older generations who uh, still harboured a lot of distrust and dislike for the Japanese. My father was in Changi, prisoner of war camp. He was never the same as a man going through what all the occupants of that particular facility uh, went through. He died um, when I was, I think, about nine years old. And um, it's interesting when I look back at that and, and how I felt, um, and in the context of later when I watched Shintaro and, and the samurai, I had no concept of prejudice to the Japanese people. I'm shocked that this sort of samurai is permitted to show sure. For a lot of people, it was just too much. The shock jocks and headline writers of the time had a field day. I question the mental health of a nation which permits its schoolchildren to be exposed to the current cult of Japanese sadism and cruelty in the guise of a TV hero. Now, of course, what I meant by that was that I had these children totally involved, as it seemed, in this whole thing. It was like a great club. And there was a lot of response to that at first. A lot of people agreed. It's a normal knee-jerk reaction. If you don't like something, but you don't know quite why, everybody loves the first person comes along with a very good, argued reason. And the, I think schoolmaster did argue that it was possibly promoting violence. A lot of the letters just didn't like the Japs, and so they were only too happy to find another reason uh, to kick a race for any reason whatsoever. But the Aussie public had a few surprises up its sleeve. 1965 was still a very white Australia, but Shintaro and his ninjas had more friends than many thought. However, then there was an interesting groundswell, and a lot of letters from people who had obviously been watching it with the children wrote explaining the context of the show, the whole idea of the Japanese mythology, of the noble art of the samurai, of the task that they took on, of the sacrifice in ways akin to uh, the Christian crusaders. And uh, a lot of spirited argument went back and forth. Mr. Morgan. Uh, should return to school and learn a little more about his facts before he starts his I Hate Japs campaign on our... Well, you know, that's absurd, absolutely absurd, because that was about the last thing that I was saying. All I was doing was commenting on the, the fact that there were some aspects of this program which were certainly affecting children because it was reflecting the sort of sadistic aspects of part of the Japanese culture, which we can't deny because we know the facts of what was happening in the war. And I think that was the thing that, that I was really talking about. Do as you please. But it was all lost on the kids. They reckoned they knew what Shintaro was about. The message of the show was actually quite simple. There were the good guys and the bad guys. There was a little bit of fuzziness involved there, because as I recall, uh, one of the things that we liked about Shintaro was that, or I liked about him, was that he was an outsider. Shintaro! he would always rescue uh, the innocent and, and, and protect the weak. These are all positive messages. OK. Oh. He wasn't a vigilante. He was, in fact, supposedly a, a secret agent. And, in fact, of course, when you look at him that way, that ties into the secret agent genre that was also starting to become popular in the mid-60s. But what about all that senseless Japanese violence? Well, firstly, I object to the term senseless violence. I find all of it completely sensible. He did have a strong moral code. He was out for vengeance and he went about his way and he never started a fight. He always... He's like an AFL footballer in that regard. He never started one. Shintaro, now you will die. There was exactly the same code of honour with the Shintaro, that he was not one who would just reach for his sword at the first sign of trouble. It was always to save the day at the end of trying other alternative means. I didn't want to fight in the hotel. As a child, it never seemed as violent as shooting somebody like a cowboy did, or, or an Indian with an arrow, which is what we'd see. It didn't seem as violent as that to me. As a kid, you don't relate to it literally thinking, oh, gee, all those people have been killed. 
as much as when you're playing out in the bush or in the backyard, you're not thinking, oh, oh, gee, I've, uh, you know, I've got to shoot my, my best friend Stevie now and he's actually going to be dead because you're just, it's, it, it's, it's play. And I, I don't, you don't, I don't think as a kid you're actually thinking through the actual reality of um, the, the death actually exists in that way. I have no regrets because at the time I was doing what I saw as my duty, which was to be a commentator on matters which were affecting young people uh, and to, you know, try to do something about it. Prepare to die! Uh -huh. While a lot of kids were samurai and ninjas in their heads, the truth was they just didn't look the part. The closest thing that a lot of them had to Japanese gear was their pyjamas. If only someone could sell them the real stuff. Well, I think we were rather surprised in the beginning, but if there was a quid in it, we were going to be in it too. The Lindsays were just one of the companies that made the spin-offs that gave the kids all the things they didn't know they needed, till they watched TV. Prized items such as jet black ninja outfits, complete with mask, were all the go. Gintaro, all those who oppose me must surely die. Samurai jackets. This is one samurai jacket. You'll see that it's got the yellow piping and the, and the red colour. I'm not quite sure what, what the, the difference was, but that was one of the jackets. And this is the other. This, is, this was how, how it displayed in the, in the store. This is a different type of jacket with a, with a sash. They were available. Some lucky children had them when they were watching the samurai. I bought them when I was about 50 but I'm still the lucky man to have them. They are my samurai jackets. It was one of the first shows that you could really buy merchandise for. I mean, if it was there today, it'd be a billion dollar industry if it was today. Often we were invited in to see a pilot and we'd know what it was like. And then we'd go back to the factory, you had the photo, and we did a pattern, a paper pattern for everything we made. We had cutters who did that. I give up. Because they were already making cowboy and Indian outfits in the family business, TV arriving full, just riddled with American cowboy shows. He says it was like having a million dollars worth of free advertising. But the good stuff was the hardware. No self-respecting samurai or ninja could be without his sword. There were plastic shuriken and plastic swords and the ninja suits, but we couldn't afford them anyway because we didn't have very much money. And the only one I would have liked were the plastic swords. They had a colour photograph of some of the characters in, which were not on the gum set, so they would have been quite good. Although there were some things you just couldn't get. Of course, I wanted blinding dust. <laughs> That's what I wanted. I wanted blinding dust. Take this! The Eager Ninja Blinding Trick! For the avid collector, there were the special samurai cards, the passport to a not-so-secret society. As a result of the samurai, we had bubblegum cards. They cost uh, sixpence a, a pack, and I think you got three cards per packet. In classrooms across the nation, samurai cards became the bane of teachers' lives. We'd be sitting around doing swapsies and I can remember one time I had the set in my hands and it was on the lap and we were sort of doing this uh, under the desk. It was in an art class and the teacher, the headmistress came in so we all had to stand up and the cards went everywhere. The cards themselves were interesting. They had scenes from the program but on the back you put together a great big uh, shot of Shintaro. So the cards were very exciting. That was something we could carry in our pocket and be very, very proud of. We could have a set of cards. And so we had everybody in the program in our hands. We could sleep with this under our pillow and dream at night. It was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We wouldn't allow them to come to school. And uh, we, exactly, we banned those and we also banned the, banned the cards. That's right. I am Shintaro. By the time Channel 9 had screened the first series of 52 programs, it was clear that they had a samurai boom on their hands, whether they understood what was happening or not. 
I thought it was very bold of them after the first block of samurai show they had. And they said, do you like this? If you liked us, let us know. Well, they were inundated, so they bought more. But I thought at the time that was very bold because dubbed, television program, Japanese? How obscure is that? <laughs> Not only would there be more samurai programs, but the craze was about to reach a new oh. height. Kill him! Kill him! The man himself was coming down under. It's useless. They can't hear you. Nineteen sixty five had been a big year. Australia had gone from its slightly sleepy, self contained self to being obsessed with samurais and ninjas. But just watching the samurai on TV wasn't enough. The time had come to bring Shintaro from Japan to meet his Australian fans. It would be an experience for both sides. It was in the news Shintaro is coming to Australia. I think I got whiplash spinning around to my mother and saying, I've got to go to the Sydney Stadium. She said, why? I said, Shintaro's on. Who's Shintaro? I said, just, look, can you, can you organise it for me, please? I need to go to the Sydney Stadium to see Shintaro. Christmas Day 1965, just three days short of a year since the first episode of The Samurai went to air. Shintaro, or at least the actor that played him, Koichi Ose, landed at Sydney Airport. The result was pandemonium. At last, Australian kids could get their hands on Shintaro. My main recollection of it, frankly, is screaming fans, and particularly screaming teenagers, um, practically pushing the poor man over. But he's a, a very well-respected actor in Japan, and was at the time as well, which I think is why he was attracted to the series, because it was a highly artful, respectful series. Anyway, his, the, the poor bastards come to Australia, and he's got six-year-olds kicking the shit out of him because they want to get to him. The poor guy doesn't know what's going on. Osei had been brought out by the sweets and candy makers, who were the force behind much of the merchandising. When you think about it, I can't think of any other character that, that uh, a gum manufacturer and card manufacturer bought out like that, or had a big part of a show there. I mean, certainly not... They had Starsky and Hutch, and you know, they had all these other shows that were huge, you know, uh, even movie cards, the monkeys, etc. They never supported them like they supported Shintaro. There was a real mystique about him, I think, that, that, uh, that Australia had never seen before, and Australian kids had never seen before. Kids couldn't believe that this was the man who could do all of this, and here he was. It would blow your mind. You're watching this feudal Japan thing on on television, and here he is in the full gear. Amazing. あの、but I was unaware that there had been an actual visit of Shintaro and, the, and the, the, the ninja to Australia until I discovered something one day which told me what had actually happened. And having seen what I discovered, I don't know how on earth I missed the fact that it had been on in the first place. It must have been the Women's Weekly it had a photo spread, I think, and uh, I got wind of it being a bit of a... But <clears throat> I think I thought those who would have gone to see him were dicks. <laughs> but most kids couldn't wait. Anticipation among fans was intense. Performances played for six days, attracting 6,000 ninja-clad kids each time. All up, more people than saw the Beatles. My dear old Uncle Jack has since been gathered, but uh, took me to see the live uh, samurai show at the Sydney Stadium. 
which isn't there anymore. Uh, it was a wood and tin structure that they had fights in. And Christmas in Sydney at the Sydney Stadium, you couldn't have got a hotter place to hold it. I'm there in my full ninja outfit, right, with the head thing on, the whole deal, with my sword, I'm going to see Shintaro. My Uncle Jack said that, you know, it was like a sea of ants because there were all these kids dressed as ninjas. And uh, there you are on the wooden seats. They were the real bleachers there at Sydney Stadium. And it was the world's unbelievably hottest day. I was also a kid with a little bit of asthma. So <laughs> you can imagine all these bad things coming together. I had that hood on and everything like that. And out comes the samurai. For young boys at that age, it was just as good as the Beatles. It was like, wow, the samurai, this is fantastic. I was dressed up. I think I had an old dressing gown on of some variety to resemble a kimono or whatever. Um, and I had my trusty uh, two sticks down my belt and my star knives. I was dumbfounded at the show. I was just in shock. There were ninjas running everywhere, coming down on ropes and, and flash bombs going off and God knows what. And then Shintaro would appear and a beautiful white light there shining like a god. I was completely shocked. It was the first show I ever saw. Um, and uh, it was fabulous. It was so fabulous, the tour was expanded to Melbourne. When the news got out, 7,000 excited fans swamped Essendon Airport. I went to Essendon Airport to see the Beatles arrive in 1964, and there were people lining the streets of Essendon watching them go past. And to have heard later on that there were more people to greet Shintaro at uh, the airport in 1965 than there were for the Beatles it was just an incredible thing to hear. I think he drew a bigger crowd than Judy Garland, who was also on at uh, Festival Hall around about that time. Very much a pop star. There were screaming girls at the, at the Festival Hall gig. Newspapers were now suggesting Osei was hot in more ways than one. After a whirlwind 15-day tour and 12 live shows, a stunned Koichi Osei returned to Japan, astonished by his reception. Back in Australia, rival network Channel 7 was looking for a samurai of its own. Channel 7 had a brilliant <laughs> stroke of genius and thought, well, if they're doing all right with a Japanese show, we should get one ourselves. With the success of Samurai, we were looking for more of the same. It, it's always, uh, whenever something's very successful, someone else wants to do the same thing. That's still true today. It was called Phantom Agents. The network had high hopes. We used to watch that to get our fix of the Samurai when it wasn't on but I never quite liked it so much because it, it wasn't as, well, picturesque because it was set in Tokyo in the 20th century and they looked like motorcycle cops. You shouldn't have shot him. A gun's our last resort. Always remember, we're Phantom Agents. Uh, I still remember that and, uh, you know, they had all the samurai, but it was in modern day. That was halfway interesting, but it certainly wasn't the samurai. The show had several reruns and I guess a lot of people then were sated with it and they found other things to be interested in. In order to save Earth from the attacks of the Megolians, they must once more present the globe meter to one of their fellow creatures and send him to Earth. But that wasn't the end of it. The success of the samurai had inspired programmers to try other Japanese films that once wouldn't have been considered. There was a couple of movies that were shown on Saturday afternoon. Starman, who was this Japanese superhero, but he was a little portly, which was kind of funny because he had the full body stocking on. If, if Starman, you know, turned side on, you sort of go, wow, Starman, you got to lay off on those Kieran beers. You know what I mean? <laughs> Shintaro. Go ahead, Ninja. What are you trying to do? It was only the samurai with Shintaro and his ninjas that really clicked. Even now, more than three decades later, it still connects with its old audience. Gary 
was part of a samurai season that toured the country showing old episodes. This was from one of the shows that we did uh, at the Valhalla Cinema. Every, every show we did was a sellout, smash success. Wonderfully done. I knew that there was a large fan base out there of my age group, the baby boomer age group, that would definitely be interested in um, revisiting the samurai. And they all came out of the woodwork when uh, it was announced that we were putting it out. And the initial sales were most encouraging on every one of the series that I put out, all six series. So there was definitely a base of somewhere around a thousand people who would automatically buy uh, each of the box sets that were released. You couldn't have fitted a, a cigarette paper between the people in the cinema. It was absolutely packed. They were hanging from the rafters. There were people my age who had seen it when they were little kids at school. Their sons, their sons' sons, their sons' sons' sons. There were generations of people. It was the most incredible afternoon. The samurai feeling of all the people in that cinema. There was a golden halo right around the whole cinema of samurai memory. It was incredible. There's a sushi restaurant in Parramatta Road, Annandale, that I went to quite frequently. Wonderful sushi. There is a photo uh, of Shintaro autographed to the owner of the bar. There's an interesting thing with anyone who's been a fan of the samurai, you have this brotherhood thing. So immediately he and I got along like a house on fire. I went, you've got the photo of Shintaro. He's gone, yes, I saw him here. I saw, I saw him at Sydney Stadium. Oh, my God. Fans like Gary, though, have made a much closer personal connection. I was in Japan and I got to meet Shintaro. Uh, I went to his office. Uh, he had had phone calls on my behalf for a week. So when I got to his office, I was taken in by his staff uh, and he was sitting at his desk, sitting back, puffing on a cigarette like a very successful businessman. And I stood at the door and he must have been waiting for something, heaven knows what. But after a, a pregnant pause, he turned around and looked. And I was just standing, shaking my head. And he looked a little bit concerned. And I said, Shintaro Akikusa. Well, Shintaro was really, really chuffed. He was absolutely incredulous. He, he was expecting anything on earth but except a fan from 40 years ago. We went to dinner the next night at his request. It was a wonderful restaurant, a very special restaurant, invitation only. Wow, looks good. So I met all of his friends, and at the end of the night, after I had said, I've got to go, I've got to go, I've got to go, and he said, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. And I suddenly had this in my hand, and I thought, now, what can that be? And I said to my friend, what have I got? He said, that says Osekowicz which was his stage name. There were tags on the top that, from an airline. So I opened it, Osekowicz again on the inside. But when I looked at what was inside, this is what I discovered. The wig worn by Osekowicz as Shintaro Akakusa, tied with special paper wraps to protect it from any evil that might become. I couldn't possibly accept that. I handed it back instantly. He insisted that after 40 years of such fanhood, I should have his wig. So I am happy to say that I am now the proud possessor of the hair of Shintaro Akikusa. All good things come to an end. In the last episode, Tombe wakes to find a letter. Shintaro was gone. The Samurai played for 10 series on Australian and Japanese television. It lasted till the late 70s. But by then, a new generation wanted something different. It was more than just a children's television show. It was written at various levels. The obviously entranced lots of adults who could see you know, greater themes going on behind the obvious. It was the complete introduction of a completely different culture to people who'd never seen anything like it before. We were all looking for something a little bit different, not necessarily another group of long-haired blokes playing guitars to annoy our parents. 
totally different from what we knew, which had been all sort of European and American influenced. It was a mixture of ancient and the Wild West. The medieval romance, the epic storytelling that I really liked. It was very, you know, Lord of the Rings in its sort of scale and the scope of the storytelling. It was a turning point in Australian history, social history, and I don't think that's an overstatement. It actually opened up a different world to you, which is a legitimate culture, which hopefully one day I'll find out more about. So in that sense, I think it was a wonderful thing. It really was. It was certainly better than Macau's Navy in that respect. お見つけ日をご覧になっていただきましたオーストラリアのファンの皆さん、こんな年を取った秋草慎太郎ですが、今後どうぞよろしくお願いいたします。Taro, thank you. Arigato gozaimasu for giving me such a wonderful childhood. Dude, you rocked. What a wonderful man and what a wonderful series. You were real in my life as a nine-year-old boy. I thought you were great. The messages and principles that you taught me, I've carried on for the rest of my life. And may your sword stay sharp, my friend. Hats off.